Anastasia and this is Cozy Corner, a place for me to talk about life and feelings and art and anything else on my mind. So grab a drink and get cozy and we'll begin. Hello, it's me. Hi, it's nice to talk to you again. It's currently 11pm and it's Friday the 7th of March and for once I got everything done on my list for today and you know what, I was sitting in the bath just thinking why not record a little podcast. So I hope you're doing well, I hope your week's going well. I come to you this week with a bit of a serious podcast but this is something that I feel really strongly about and I really want to share this with you. So this episode I'll be talking about the disappearance of Andrew Gosden. This is a really serious case and I don't know, I just want to share the message a little bit. As a disclaimer, all the information here that I'm talking to you about today is just taken from Wikipedia and I've compiled it into my own little sections that I'm going to read to you. And as well, just quickly, the reason why I feel so strongly about this case and that I want to share it with you here is because it happened so close to where I'm from and even where I am right now. As well as that, Andrew was born in the same year that I was born, 1993, so I feel like he would be the kind of person I could have been friends with. Seems to like similar things that I like, similar personality. So I've always felt intrigued about what happened with Andrew and yeah. Let's get into it. So Andrew Gosden was a 14-year-old boy who disappeared on the 14th of September 2007 from Doncaster in South Yorkshire. He's been missing now for 13 years, 7 months and 23 days on the day that I'm recording this podcast. So let's start by going over the day that Andrew disappeared. His mum Glenys remembers him as particularly irritable and noted that Andrew was having a hard time waking up that day, which was unusual for him. At 8.05am, Andrew left his house and was seen walking across his local park to his usual bus stop by a family friend. But instead of taking the school bus, Andrew diverted from his usual route and walked to a cash machine at a local garage. He withdrew £200 from his bank account. I just want to say here that Andrew had £214 in the account, but since the ATM would only allow withdrawals of £20 notes, That's all he could withdraw. Andrew was then seen on CCTV returning back to his house. Back at home, Andrew put his school uniform in the washing machine and his school blazer on the back of his chair. He changed into casual clothes, a slipknot t-shirt, black jeans and a bag with metal band patches on it. He took his wallet, keys and a portable PlayStation console, a PSP if anyone remembers those. None of Andrew's other possessions have been identified as missing including his passport. Andrew's dad, Kevin Gosden, said that his son didn't seem to have taken a jumper or coat or his PSP charger. He also left £100 in cash that he'd saved up from birthdays. At 8.30am, Andrew left his house and was seen walking to Doncaster Rail Station, where he purchased a one-way ticket to London for £31.40. The ticket seller later recalled that she told Andrew a return would be just 50p more, but he insisted on purchasing a single ticket. Now, this is weird to me because I have been on that route so many times. There's a train from my hometown to Doncaster and then to London. Going to uni when I was 18, I would get that train all the time up and down to come home and go back to London. So it's so weird to me because I can imagine that Doncaster station and I can imagine the ticket hall and I can imagine getting the ticket but it's just weird to have known these places and to kind of imagine Andrew's journey that morning. So at 9.53am, Andrew was witnessed boarding the train to King's Cross, London, alone. One woman reported sitting next to Andrew and she described him as quiet and engrossed in playing his game. Since Andrew had failed to attend morning lessons, his school tried to contact his parents. They left them a message and informed them that their son hadn't attended school that day However, the school dialed the incorrect number for Andrew's parents and the message was left for the wrong person. The last confirmed sighting of Andrew was at 11.25am on the 14th of September 2007 as he left London's King's Cross station's main entrance. 
it's so sad, you know, that just from that honest mistake of that person calling the wrong number and Andrew's parents just didn't know he was missing. So what happened next? Remember, Andrew's family weren't aware of their son not attending school that day due to the incorrect number being called. They sat down to eat that night, thinking he was in his room or in the converted cellar, playing video games or doing homework. And when they discovered Andrew wasn't in the house, they initially thought he might have been with a friend or neighbour and had simply lost track of time. Glenys and Kevin phoned around Andrew's friends, who let them know that he hadn't been at school that day. At around 7pm, the police were called. Andrew's sister Charlotte said, It was just a complete panic. We initially thought something must have happened on the way to school. When we found out that he hadn't even been to school, even tried to go to school, that was even more worrying. Andrew's family started searching for him immediately, but found nothing. Within three hours of discovering Andrew's disappearance, a missing persons leaflet was produced. That weekend, the police searched the bushes around the house and around Andrew's route, but found nothing. Three days later, the police confirmed that Andrew had travelled to London after they spoke to the woman who had sold him the train ticket. Kevin Gosden later stated that the purchase of a single ticket, rather than a return, didn't seem strange to him, as Andrew knew numerous people in London that he could have stayed with. Initial searches in London focused on areas where the Gosden family have relatives. Days after the disappearance, the Gosden family travelled to London and handed out flyers in any location they felt Andrew would have an interest in visiting, especially museums and exhibitions. So, a little about further investigations here. The family and police both investigated the possibility that Andrew may have gone to London to meet someone who he had met online, but there was absolutely no evidence for this. Andrew didn't use a computer and didn't even have an email address. Digital forensic investigations found no trace of any activity on Andrew's school and library computers or any communication or account activity on his PSP. Andrew's sister Charlotte said that he didn't seem interested in social media or connecting with other people through the internet as he just didn't seem social. After the CCTV trail went cold after the last sighting of Andrew at King's Cross, the investigation moved on to trying to work out why he decided to go to London. The Gosden family speculated that Andrew may have visited to take in the sights as he loved the city and would visit with his family to see other relatives that lived there. Andrew enjoyed visiting London's exhibitions and museums on these trips and had a good sense of the public transport system. Kevin Gosden stated that his son was confident in navigating his way around the city and it's important to mention that travelling on buses was free for children at the time of the disappearance. There are a few events around the time of Andrew's disappearance that have been discussed as possible reasons for him travelling to London. 30 Seconds to Mars and Sixth, I think that's called, were both bands that were performing that night in different locations and were of a genre that Andrew enjoyed. Unfortunately, there isn't enough evidence to confirm whether Andrew travelled for these events or if he even attended them. I want to move on now to possible sightings of Andrew. On the first anniversary of Andrew's disappearance, it was reported that 122 possible sightings had been reported from all over the UK, with 45 from London and 11 from Brighton. Kevin Gosden stated that there were two or three sightings within the first week of the disappearance that seemed credible because of the way the witnesses claimed that Andrew had spoken to them. These sightings include one which placed Andrew at the Pizza Hut restaurant on Oxford Street on the day he went missing. Now, for context, Oxford Street is a very short and simple train journey from King's Cross where Andrew was last seen, or it's about an hour's walk from there too. Other unconfirmed sightings include Covent Garden on the day he arrived in London, Oxford Street on the 17th of September, sleeping in a park in Southwark on the 18th of September, and getting off a local train from Waterloo on the 19th of September. It was reported that Andrew had appeared to have obtained warmer clothes on this last sighting. The Gosden family have been critical of the police investigation and, understandably, these sightings weren't really followed up. Nothing was done with them really, which must have been so disappointing for the family. So here's where things get really interesting. All the way in November 2008, which is just over a year since Andrew was last seen, 
a man visited Leo Minster Police Station, which is in West Midlands, and he used the intercom system to talk to a police officer, saying he had information about Andrew. Since it was in the evening, the intercom was in use rather than staff being present at the reception of the police station. By the time an officer had arrived at the station, the man had left. The station is located in a location that would have required special effort to visit. In September 2009, Kevin Gosden appealed to the gay community to help find his son. The family considered that Andrew could have been struggling with his sexuality, as children who are LGBT plus are much more likely to run away than children who are not. Kevin said, We are a pretty open family, so have wondered if he was gay or struggling with his sexual identity, and found it too awkward to raise. If he is gay, we do not have any issue with it. He is loved unconditionally by both my wife and I and his sister. In 2017, the police launched a fresh appeal. They began investigating similar glasses prescriptions to Andrew's, requests from the passport office on national insurance, and circulating Andrew's DNA, fingerprints, dental and health records. The tone of the statement provided indicated that the police appeared to believe that Andrew may still be alive. In 2018, someone had reported an online conversation with an individual with the username Andy Roo, a nickname that Andrew had with his family. This person claimed their boyfriend had left them and they needed £200 to cover rent. When someone offered to send them money, Andy Roo claimed that they didn't have a bank account as they had left home when they were 14. This link was investigated, but the individual wasn't identified. Andrew's family have kept his room as he left it and not changed the locks on their house as he was known to have taken his key. His bank account has not been used since he made the withdrawal on the morning of the 14th of September 2007. So I just want to talk now about who Andrew was as a person, about his family, just about him. The Gosden family live in a nice suburb of Doncaster in South Yorkshire. Andrew's parents are both committed Anglican Christians, although they didn't baptise their children as they didn't want to impose their views on them. Andrew had been a club scout, but told his dad that he didn't want to be involved with the group a few months before disappearing. His family described him as a home bird who rarely left the house and never left without saying where he was going. Andrew was a gifted student with an 100% attendance record, and had been expected to score straight A's in his GCSE exams. He was known as being an excellent mathematician and was destined to go to Cambridge, which, if you didn't know, is one of the best and, like, highly rated universities in England. Andrew was said to have had a neutral attitude about school, hoping that his upcoming term would be more of a challenge after cruising through his education so far. In the 2006 summer holidays, Andrew attended a two-week-away-from-home school as part of the Young, Gifted and Talented programme. This summer school was for children from all around the UK, aged between 11 and 16, who were in the top 5% academically. Andrew seemed to return from the trip uncharacteristically enthused about the work he'd been doing there. Andrew's dad Kevin described him as absent-minded, not streetwise and potentially vulnerable. He was a deep character who didn't get worked up or moody. His teachers described him as a shy, quiet young man who was mature beyond his years. Although Andrew was 14 when he disappeared, he was small for his age and sources have stated he looked about 12. Andrew is deaf in one ear, wears strong prescription glasses and has a distinctive double ridge on his right ear. He had light brown hair at the time of his disappearance but was planning to dye it black. Andrew had owned a few mobile phones between the ages of 10 and 12 but ended up losing them and didn't bother accepting the offer of a new one from his parents, stating that he'd prefer a new Xbox instead. He was interested in video games and metal bands. So that is Andrew's story. As I mentioned, I'm particularly interested in Andrew's disappearance because it just feels so familiar. The location is close to where I'm from things that are discussed, the trips to London are something I experienced myself and I had friends like Andrew. The reality of the situation seems so stark and I really feel for Andrew's whole family. They tirelessly campaign and bring light to to Andrew's case and to other missing people and anything could help. 
Who knows who might have seen Andrew? And what do you think happened? I ask you to speculate respectfully, of course. And I'm going to do the same here, but to me it just sounds like Andrew left and maybe got, I don't know, maybe just ended up staying there. I think what Andrew's dad said about potentially Andrew felt like he couldn't be open about his sexuality, that that seems pretty likely for someone to um, disappear under that circumstance. Maybe Andrew didn't mean to be missing for so long, but it's hopeful that the police are still searching and he could be anywhere. He could just be an anonymous person that people aren't recognising as Andrew. We have to remember that Andrew went missing when he was only 14 years old, so he would look different now. There's details in the story that really stick with me. For example, Andrew just changing his routine when he was clearly a really kind of well-behaved, quiet person. It seems uncharacteristic, so maybe he was just bored and just wanted to do something. The way Andrew left his clothes in the washing machine and left his PSP charger, all those little details seem like he was going to return or he intended to return. There's so many possibilities here, but this is one case I will forever be checking for updates and I just have a feeling that Andrew's out there. The story has too many details that allude to him maybe just wanting to get away for a bit. I also wanted to just add something personal here, but for a while when I lived in London, I volunteered at a homeless shelter. It's an amazing shelter in North London and basically people that are homeless can go there at night. They can sleep over it till the morning. Um, the residents get breakfast and then dinner at night time and in the daytime they just do their own thing. And it was such a nice environment and so nice to meet those people, have little conversations. Basically when I was there I would make beds, do laundry and mainly make food with a whole team of other volunteers. Um. Let me say this, people from all kinds of circumstances end up homeless or on the streets. That shelter showed me that anyone can go missing or have to go missing or end up missing or end up homeless and their family might not even know. I'm not saying that happened to Andrew but I'm just saying people leave for loads of reasons and sometimes people get into a situation that they didn't expect to get into. There were people at the shelter who had been lawyers who had ended up homeless. There were people that ran away from home because they were LGBT plus and they weren't sure how people would take it in their family or they had been kicked out. Obviously, the kicked out thing is not the case here with Andrew and his family, but I'm just trying to show you, like, there are so many circumstances and so many twists and turns that can happen in people's lives that just lead to other situations. So what can you do to help? Well, please Google Andrew Gosden, take a good look at the pictures. There are some age progression pictures on there too, so you can see what Andrew would look like now. I also urge you to listen to the podcasts and interviews that Kevin Gosden has done. Try and educate yourself on this case if you are interested, and particularly if you're in the UK. So my shout out today is a little bit different, but it is the charity Missing People. Missing people are a lifeline in the UK for anyone affected by someone going missing. And I recommend you go look on their website. There are missing person posters on there and loads of information on how you can help them. I really cannot imagine the pressure, the stress, the awfulness of dealing with someone that you love going missing. And I want to kind of stress that here, like... I can't imagine what Andrew's family are going through when they seem like such lovely people from what I've seen. Their support of Andrew, their unconditional love, is really something lovely to see in such a horrible situation. Thank you for listening. Like I said, please go look up Andrew, read more about him, learn about him, see his face. And let's hope for an update sooner rather than later. I'm not going to do a prompt this week just because this is a podcast about Andrew and I don't want to take away from that. I hope you enjoyed listening to this and found it interesting in some way. It was really nice just to talk to you about this and if this means that 10 more people know about Andrew Gosden's disappearance, then I'm happy. I hope you are all staying safe and lovely 
and thank you so so much for listening as always give me a little email if you get to the end of this podcast and do you have any comments or want to say hi or anything bye for now bye